Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam wa ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Our respected brothers and sisters, welcome to our Ikna Ayala Quran webinar series. This week, inshallah, the verses are from Surah Al Hajj, verses 1 to 7. And the topic is evidence for the Akira. And today's presentation, inshallah, will be given by Brother Yasser Ali. Zakallah khair, Brother Shab. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa min wala. So, as Brother Shab mentioned, I would like to review the first seven verses of Surah Al Hajj. Uh, specifically discussing the topic uh, related to the hereafter, but specifically looking into some of the evidences as as are mentioned in these particular verses as well as some of the others. But just to, by way of introduction, to introduce the topic, um, when we look at a, a deceased person who is left to natural causes, we see that the journey that a deceased person takes can be understood at two different levels. You know, on one hand, you can understand it uh, physiologically, where certain physiological changes uh, take place. The, the heart stops beating and the lungs stop breathing, and the body is starved of blood and oxygen. And this results initially in the impalement of the skin. And then gradually, uh, we see that first the muscles and the body tends to stiffen, but as the flesh starts to rot, you know, the stiffening wanes and the temperature drops, and eventually what is left is dried out bones. The body, the journey of the soul, however, is very different in that it is not something that can be gauged through scientific inquiry or experimentation. It's simply beyond human capacity to do that. And this is where we see within our Islamic tradition, as well as in many other religious traditions, the concept of a hereafter comes in. You know, the life after death, the resurrection, the day of reckoning, and, and so forth. Um, and we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions very clearly, uh, referring to this as ilm al-ghayb, that وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّهُ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has the keys to the unseen, no one has knowledge concerning them except he subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we look at these verses, we need to keep in mind that there are certain limitations that are inherent in our human capacity to understand. And, and thereby, when we talk about evidence, uh, quote unquote, then it is not something that will be as, as clear as, as you may Otherwise, imagine considering other kind of scientific proofs of, of worldly phenomena that we see, because this involves something that's simply beyond human, human capacity to comprehend. And so keeping that in mind, uh, I would like to begin the, the uh, tafsir of Surah Al-Hajj. Now, in terms of revelation, we see that the Surah Al-Hajj is generally considered to be a Meccan Surah. Uh, even though it has uh, many verses that were revealed after the Hijrah of the Prophet وسلم, to Medina. And in terms of the time period of, of when it was revealed, it was it's, a lot of scholars agree that it was revealed towards the last period of the Meccan era. Uh, you know, the, after Allah, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, spent 12 or 13 years of, of preaching the message of Tawheed uh, to the Meccans, um, many of them continue to insist on their disbelief. And at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this surah as a way of giving them a last warning. And, and, and consequently, we see that the tone in this, that Allah adopts in this surah is, is significantly um, harsh, uh, almost aggressive in, in, in some respect, because it was the last warning. You know, we tried for 12, 13 years. You people did not listen. Here's your last chance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ اتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّ زَلْزَلَةَ السَّاعَةِ شَيْءٌ عَظِيمٌ That, O oh mankind, 
Fear your Lord. Indeed, the convulsion of the final hour is a terrible thing. Now, taqwa, as we know, it comes from the root wiqaya, which means to protect, to protect oneself. And essentially what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us is that we need to guard and uh, and protect oneself from the consequences of our own action. Uh, action. So the consequences of living this life in, in with this awareness and this consciousness of of being careful all the time. That is essentially what what helps us and what what uh, transpires into what we refer to as as piety. Then Allah says, "Inna zalzala inna zalzala tasaati shayun adim." And the the word inna, as we understand it, it's used to remove to remove doubt and to emph to and to add emphasis. That it's it's basically used to emphasize, you know, certainly without a shred of a doubt. Uh, and then Allah says, Zalzala tasa'a. Now, Zalzala is one of those few words in used in the Quran that has a four letter root. Um, and it, it's if you look at the construction of it, uh, and these, these are called rubai, meaning the rubai form. If you look at the construction of it, it's made of two letters which repeat itself. Uh, so, like, for example, there are other examples like zahzaha or waswasa. And what's interesting about these words is that the repetition itself it highlights uh, repetition uh, in meaning as well so waswasa would translate into um, uh, repeatedly whisper or zalzala would, would mean uh, zalla means to slip or to shake and so zalzala would mean to repeatedly shake you know over and over again and so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as, as he mentions you know, this repeated successive uh, non-stop shaking of the earth, it will continue for for a period of time. Yusaa is generally translated in mo modern Arabic as an hour, but a sa here refers to a period of time, and only Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows how long that it will last. Uh, but it will continue for so long that will it will feel like eternity. You know, generally when we look at earthquakes, for example, we see that they tend to last only a few seconds, and and we what we observe is the destruction that is left in the wake of, of the earthquake. But here, uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it would you know, continue to last, it will feel like eternity. In the second verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a visual. Allah says that, يَوْمَ تَرَوْنَهَا that you will see it, um, on, on the day you see it, it referring to the, the shaking. تَذْهَلُ كُلُّ مُرْضِعَةٍ عَنَّا أَرْضَعَةٍ Now, Tadhalu, essentially, um, in the Arabic language, it's it, it means to become so overwhelmed and to become so frightened that it almost makes you forget about something that's very important. So, for example, when panic ensues, you know, in, in the wake of a panic, you know, people running around, it becomes very chaotic. Um, Allah used, uses the word murdi'atin. Um, in the Arabic language, you know, the ta marbuta, it's generally used to denote femininity. So if you have, if I say, you know, Muslimun, you know, a, a Muslim man, and then if I add ta marbuta, it would become a Muslimatun or a Muslim woman. But there is an exception to this rule. And the exception is when the meaning of the word is that it's exclusive to women um, and it cannot be applied to a man, uh, then we don't need to add the marbuta. And so if uh, when we talk about a pregnant woman, uh, when we, we can use the word hamilun as referring to a pregnant woman instead of hamilatun. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to a woman who is nursing uh, her child, uh, a mother that's nursing her child. But uh, Allah could have used murdi'un, but Allah used murdi'atin, and the difference between the two, and there is a reason why Allah used this, is when we say murdi'un, it refers to a woman who is actually nursing, whose child is is, is young and, and small, uh, in the age of nursing, and so she is nursing, but she may not necessarily be nursing at this very moment. But when we say murdi'atun, that refers to a woman who is actually nursing in, in that very moment. And this becomes important considering that the strongest bond that you can have, the strongest relationship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created 
in this world is that of the mother and a child. And it becomes even stronger during the earlier years when, when the mother realizes the strong dependency that the child has. And it's even stronger when the mother is in the process of, of nursing the child. And so imagine that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala paints this visual that the mother, every nursing mother will be distracted from that she was nursing. And what's interesting that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not even mention explicitly that she would be distracted from her child. Allah uses amma, you know, in Arabic when we point to something, if it's if it's a living thing, then we use men. So it, could, it, it technically should have been amman. But in order to emphasize the severeness of the moment when the calamity and when, when the destructive shaking will start, that the mother will completely forget about her, her child, which is attached to her body, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uses amma. Uh, and ma is, is a construct that's used when we're referring to inanimate objects, as, as if the mother is not even aware of what is it that she was nursing. And, and so you can imagine the, the, the severity of the situation when, when that happens. And then Allah says, kullu dhati hamlin hamlaha, That every pregnant woman Will will abort her pregnancy. Will mis miscarry. What um, that and you will see people appearing intoxicated. While they are not intoxicated, but the punishment of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is severe. And then Allah says in the next verse, that of the people is he who disputes about Allah without knowledge. And follows every rebellious devil. Now, what's interesting is that Allah uses the construct, Allah uses the common noun form, and He does not use the proper form. So it's not that this person who is arguing or about or disputing about Allah is lacking a certain type of knowledge, like maybe that of aqida or or what have you, but this person is basically speaking or disputing about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without having any form of knowledge whatsoever. And, and that's important to, uh, in this construct. And then Allah says, كُتِبَ عَلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ مَنْ That it has been decreed for every devil that whoever turns to him, he will misguide him and will lead him to the punishment of the blaze. Now, kutiba generally is used when in ayatul ihkam. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, it, it's been obligated. So there is wujub that it, that's implied. Here, kutiba, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about kutiba, it's basically, um, because obviously this is not one of the uh, ayat of ihkam. So uh, what Allah is saying that it has been decreed, it has been written that whosoever would take as a friend or would befriend, uh, and Allah, you know, tawalla comes from wali, which means to ally with someone, or to befriend someone, um, that فَأَنَّهُ يُضِلُّهُ That he will lead him astray. Uh, astray. And so uh, the who refers to shaytan here, but the shayateen, it do not necessarily have to be from the shayateen of jinn. They may very well be from the shayateen of his. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Furqan, you know, when, uh, when a person would lament and say that, يَا وَيْلَتَ لَيْتَنِي لَمَا اتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيدًا that, that, that woe to me that I took uh, such and such, had I not taken such and such as, as, my, as my friend. So if we, uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that. And then comes the main verse, which we will look into in a little more detail. Um, the, one of the things that, before I, I go to the next verse, one of the things that we need to understand is that when we talk about the day of resurrection, we're not just talking about resurrection of the spirit. You know, because the spirit lives on anyway. The spirit does not die. We're actually talking about the resurrection of the physical body. And this is why we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes some of the objections or some of the questions that are being raised by the disbelievers of Mecca. You know, for example, in Surah Al-Isra, Allah, Allah mentions, وَقَالُوا أَيْذَا كُنَّا عِظَامًا وَرُفَاتًا أَإِنَّا لَمَبْعُوثُونَ خَلْقًا جَدِيدًا That they say, when we turn to bones and particles of dust, Shall we truly be raised up as a new creation? And then Allah asks the Prophet to respond. He says, قُلْ كُونُوا حِجَارَةً أَوْ حَدِيدًا That tell them that you will be raised afresh even if you turn to stone or iron. 
أو خلقا مما يكبر في صدوركم or any other form of creation that you deem hardest of all to recreate from فسيقولون من يعيدنا They will certainly ask who will bring us back to life قل الذي فطركم أول مرة Say he who created you in the first instance فسينغضون إليك رؤوسهم ويقولون They will shake their heads at you and inquire متاهو that when will that be قل عسى أن يكون قريبا that say perhaps that time might have drawn near so what's interesting is that in the very first verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I just read Allah describes them as saying that when we turn to bones and dust shall we truly be raised up as a new creation and in this particular verse what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us is that O oh people, if you should be in doubt about the resurrection, then consider that indeed we created you from dust. So in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to that very objection that you're claiming that how will you be recreated or resurrected when you turn into dust? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, we, we, we created you from dust in the first place anyway. And then Allah says, ثُمَّ مِن نُطْفَةٍ that then form a, a sperm drop, you know, a drop of bodily fluid. And what's interesting is that nutfa in its meaning, it, in, it inherently implies um, impurity. And that's why whenever the, bo the, the bodily fluid exits our bodies, we are in a state of ritual, major ritual impurity, which can only be alleviated when we, when we perform ghusl or, or, or take a bath. Uh, and then Allah says, then from a clinging clot and then from a lump of flesh formed and unformed, that we may show you. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of times people who believe in scientific miracles, they would talk and describe uh, and, and reference this particular verse as a, one of the scientific miracles that are described in the Quran. But what's important to keep in mind is that, um, you know, while, while it's, it's, it's great that we can acknowledge and, and use science to confirm uh, if we insist on the understanding that we always need to affirm whatever is mentioned in the Quran using science, that can, that can lead to very problematic consequences. Because being um, deluded by the dominance of science, given the time that we currently live in, sometimes that can take us away from the spiritual message of the Quran. It can take us away from the, the actual purpose of the Quran. In this particular verse, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the magnificence and the ability of, of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create. Uh, but focusing solely on the on the scientific aspect of it, it sometimes would take take things away. Uh, and, and that's important to keep in mind. Now, when we reflect on the meaning of this verse, you know, it essentially serves as a reality check. Um, and, the, and the message that it sends to us is that um, you know, the one who's reading the verse is likely to be a person who is a grown-up human being who, who may or may not be proud of their accomplishments. Uh, and then to, to tell that person that you, what you originally come from is najasa, you, you come from filth. You know, what, what you were before you got to the form that you are in right now, if you got on someone's clothes, you know, they would have need, needed to wash the clothes. So then why are you so arrogant that you're questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're questioning um, uh, you, 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 your ego is essentially uh, making you question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and the basic tenets of our faith. Now, I'm just going to read through the translation in the interest of time because I need, would like to say a few other things as well. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after... He says, and we settle in the wombs whom we will for a specified term, then we bring you out as a child, and then we develop you so that you may reach your time of maturity. And, and then Allah says that among you is he who is taken in, you know, the one who, who returns at an early age, and among you is he who is returned to, to an old age so that he may know after having knowledge nothing. So he is returned back to a humiliating age. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an example of resurrection, uh, whereby Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, الْأَرْضَ That you see the earth barren. فَإِذَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْهَا الْمَاءَ أَهْتَزَّتْ وَرَبَتْ 
that when, when we send upon uh, down upon it rain, it quivers and swells and grows something of every beautiful kind. So um, th that is one of the examples that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives of, of resurrection. One of the other examples, and I'll, and I'll just go through it quickly, is that of the Ashab al-Kahf, which is uh, uh, not only mentioned in the Quran, but also that's a part of the Christian tradition as well, where it is said that um, roughly around 250 of the common era, so the third century, one of the Roman emperors, and because that was a time prior to Constantine, Constantine is the one who made Christianity the state religion, and the Christians were persecuted, and so there was a there were a group of young people who took refuge in a cave, uh, and, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them to sleep for a couple hundred years, and roughly around the early to the mid of the fifth century, um, Allah subhanahu, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that was a time of an Eastern Roman emperor whose name was Theod Theodosius II. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused those to wake up. And what's interesting is that during the time of Theodosius, there were some discussions and debates about resurrection. And by virtue of waking those young men back up and uh, allowing the locals to witness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially resolved the whole debate about the resurrection. And, and Theodosius had imprisoned a few in, uh, in the bishops uh, who, who believed in the conception of resurrection. Uh, and, and, and so that, mir that miracle essentially helped guide that entire town. Um, and, and, and the remains of that cave, they are still to be found in the eastern part of Anatolia, uh, the uh, Ephesus, what's, what's referred to as Ephesus uh, or Izmir. And, and, and you can always uh, travel there and visit the, the cave. So that was one of the other examples that's related to resurrection. Now, when we talk about the evidence of the hereafter, uh, one of the evidences that frequently is cited is that would there is no absolute way of ensuring that justice prevails in this very world. And, and so a natural consequence of, of that, given that one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attribute is that Allah is just, is that there should be another uh, place, an avenue to, to reward the people who have been doing good deeds and to punish those uh, who perpetuated injustice in this world. And a logical consequence of that is that it makes sense to have the hereafter. Um, one of the other ways in which this uh, there, you know, this argument related to the hereafter could be brought up is, and uh, I, I heard this in one of the lectures from Sheikh Shabir Ali, and there's a paragraph, I'm just gonna read, read it to you because he explains it in, in, a, in a much better form that I can. You know, in philosophy, there is this whole conception uh, of you know, there are different ways and theories in t that help us discern the the truthfulness of any uh, of, of any statement, and so there is a what we call a correspondence theory of truth, and so there are two broad theories. One is called the correspondence theory, and the other is called the coherence theory of truth. So you know when if, when we go to a court of law and we have a witness who is asked to give answers. You know, what the attorney essentially does, he looks at two things. You know, first, firstly, whether the answers that the witness gives, whether they correspond to reality. So that essentially is the correspondence theory of truth. And then when all of the answers are put together, the attorney looks to see if there's a if there's coherence, you know, if, if all of those answers cohere, if you will. So based on the coherence of theory, theory of truth, um, it's not necessary that every single statement you make uh, you are sure about it, but that together, whatever statements we have, uh, they're coherent and they make sense. And so um, one of the paragraphs I'll, I'll just read to you, and this is, comes directly from the lecture of one of the lectures from Sheikh Shabir Ali, where he uses a theory of coherence. And so he says, and I quote, that if we apply the theory of coherence to the life in the hereafter, we cannot absolutely prove that there is a life of the hereafter, but it makes good sense in light of everything we believe. It makes sense in light of the injustices being perpetuated in this world. There is a strong feeling within us human beings that justice must be done. So why is that feeling justified in us? Often in this life, we see that justice does not prevail. 
the coherence theory of truth helps us here. We don't have to prove that there is a life in the hereafter, but we say that in light of everything we know, belief in the life in hereafter is coherent with the situation in this life, given that we have this deep sense of justice, which can only be satisfied if in fact there is a life in the hereafter." Um, end quote. And so I think we, I'm done. Oh, I just went over my time as well. So I'll just conclude here. Um, Jazakallah khair, uh, Inshallah, we'll open up the uh, Q&A session. So please submit your questions in writing using the questions tab within the uh, webinar. And Inshallah, I'll cluster things together um, for the speaker. So Inshallah, the first question. Um, we know that our Imam goes up and down. And we want to try and reduce the periods uh, when it's down and increase the periods when it's up. Um, what is your advice on some of the main things we can do, um, or at least acknowledge that distract us from remembering Allah so that we can do less in that direction? And what are the main things that can influence us positively uh, in, in remembering the Okay. Good. So there, there are a couple of things that may be specific to an individual. So I'm going to speak in more of general, more of a general term, general terms, uh, uh, because every person in their own situation they may be different. But one of the things that we talked about today is keeping good company. Um, and, and a lot of times when we are hanging out with folks uh, that have a certain worldview, that have a certain approach. Uh, they may not necessarily help us in our pursuit uh, of a, a stronger connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and that is where it becomes important to realize that maybe it's just about time for us to find a different company that we could engage with. You know, people who, when we look at them, that we're able to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so so that's a, that is perhaps the most important thing because... The company that we're going to keep is naturally going to have an effect on us, uh, and and it will gradually uh, even impact our worldview in terms of how we view this world uh, and and how we understand what we need to do. Other than that, you know, like maintaining a a constant regimen of dhikr, uh, it it helps us in ways that you know, sometimes there is conviction as a result of a, an intellectual exchange. But sometimes the conviction it may not necessarily be rooted in any intellectual activity, but it may simply come about as a result of constantly engaging in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, sending salawat on the Prophet. And the best form of dhikr, as we know, is to the recitation of the Qur'an, uh, perhaps uh, ideally coupled with an understanding uh, and, and trying to build an understanding and reviewing the meaning of the Qur'an as well. Uh, specifically, as it relates to the hereafter, um, a lot of times when we encounter issues in our lives, one of the greatest things that our scholars have identified as something that could help us uh, build a connection um, and, and help us alleviate the pain or suffering that we're experiencing is to ponder upon the events that will take place in the hereafter. Um, and, and so thinking about death, not in a way necessarily to distract us from the work that we're doing, but to keep in mind that whatever we're encountering in this world is uh, something that's temporal. So Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for example, buried all of his children with the exception of Fatima radiallahu anha, um, or any kind of blessings that we enjoy realizing that each blessing that you know uh, Allah blesses us with, they are by their very nature diminishing. And so by remembering our death, realizing the temporal nature of this world, maintaining good company, and maintaining a, a good regiment of dhikr with, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think that will definitely help us uh, and hopefully allow us to build a stronger connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah um, It can be said that we, we live in a scientific revolution. Why do you think that 
evidence from scientific reasoning has become a distraction from the belief in the Akira, at least for some people, but, but not for others. Mm. I, I think so. So one of the things I, I mentioned is that, yes, there is a great deal of um, scientific evidence that we can find related to different uh, aspects of our lives, uh, whether it's in, in the verse that, that we looked into that describes, that's related to the science of embryology, for example. There are other verses that talk about biological processes. There are verses that talk about the, um, the sun being, you know, the earth going around or, or orbiting around the sun. Uh, whereas, as we know, uh, even in the scholastic tradition up until the Middle Ages, uh, the Earth was considered to be the center of, of the world around which we had suns and stars and so forth. Um, but laying in a, I mean, so long as it helps us, I, I think it's difficult to draw a line specifically as to what really defines the limits or to, or to what extent we can actually engage. But it's important to keep in mind that so long as our pursuit and our understanding is helping us draw nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that essentially will be the litmus test. So I'm not really convinced or fully convinced that the scientific revolution necessarily would take you away from the path to Allah. But if we are not able to, because what happens is if we subject everything that the Quran says to scientific inquiry, and if we try to make science as the authority by which everything else needs to be judged. That's where things tend to get problematic. That's what hinders our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if we just use Quran to appreciate the, the miraculous aspects uh, and, and the scientific discoveries that are mentioned in the Quran and use that to strengthen our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to develop a greater conviction um, uh, of, of, towards our faith, then in that case, basically, it's uh, it, it's something that would help us and not really come in our ways. It, it's difficult to say that the statement that you mentioned is true in all cases. There may be certain cases where it may, may hold true. In other cases, it wouldn't. Um, the next question is about the relationship between Surah Al-Anbiya and Surah Al-Hajj. So Surah Al-Hajj is preceded by Surah Al-Anbiya. And in the last ayahs of Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the good news that will be given to the believers. Many Qaris recite the two together. Is there a significance for this sequence of events described in the Quran between Surah Al-Anbiya and Surah Al-Hajj? So um, for the purpose of today, I, I did not get a chance to review, uh, but the there is a relationship that was discovered by one of these scholars of the late 19th century, early 20th century, whose name was Hamiduddin Farahi, and, and he wrote significantly about the relationship of the surah and the, because there, there are two, two tartib, if you will, in the order. So one is the order of revelation, which is much different compared to the order in which the Quran was compiled. And because the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself instructed where to place each each of the verses and and how to position each of the surahs, there is a certain wisdom in how they're that they are structured. Um, according to and, and you can read up more about it. According to uh, Malan Hamiduddin Farai, uh, he identifies I believe seven or nine different groups and, and he links them together based on subjects and he identifies certain common patterns. Uh, I don't have my notes handy right now, and I didn't really review that. So, but you can always look it up online. Uh, there is definitely a relationship between the end of Surah uh, Surah al Nas and Surah Al Hajj. The Iqtarab al Nas is where the Surah Al Anbiya, uh, the 17th, just starts, and then uh, Surah Hajj follows that Surah. Uh, but I, I don't have any details on that right now. Okay. So the next question is about teaching the uh, topic of Akira to young children. 
Uh, realizing that it's a complex subject, realizing that it's a subject that can, if not taught correctly, instill fear in, into children. Uh, what do you think is the right age to start teaching children about Akira? And how should we teach it in the most sensitive of manners? Um, I honestly, uh, so I, I'm not an imam or I, I'm not really a counselor, so it's difficult for me. I mean, I have younger children, but um, as to what specifically, given that we live in the West and there are so many sensitivities around what needs to be introduced to children and what should be held back until a later time, um, there are some social preferences that have developed, of course, and so that's why a lot of people tend to shy away from even speaking about death with children, given that it may just upset a few people. Uh, the way I, I was taught about it as, as a young child, you know, we, we learned about it earlier on, and I, I personally feel that that is something that, if taught in a proper manner, does not necessarily instill fear, but it gives a reality check. And if there is some degree of fear, uh, if we couple that with a proper understanding of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manages things, because before clarifying Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes to the extent that the child realizes that it is not the parents who are in control, but it, it is essentially Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, who, who is in control. Before introducing those attributes, uh, I, I think we should definitely not talk about uh, death because it may just throw uh, children into, um, it, it may just scare them and it, it may not give them an avenue to to console themselves. Uh, but when you talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and describe his attributes, uh, mention that he's the one who is essentially in control, regardless of the fact that we feel that sometimes we are the ones managing our own affairs. Uh, and so long as a child internalizes that, I think that would be a good time to introduce the idea of death and the hereafter and so forth. Jazakallah you talked um, earlier on about the journey of the soul and the journey of the body. And while we don't see the soul and we do see the body, um, what steps should we take so that we can better take care of the needs of the soul that we don't see um, and not allow the desires of the body to dominate? Could you repeat that last part? Um, how can we better take care of the needs of the soul and its remembrance of the akira without allowing the desires of the body to overdominate? So I think the first question is somewhat aligned with this one. And so the things that we talk about maintaining and keeping good company, uh, maintaining a, a daily regiment of, of the adhkar that have been taught by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, you know, recite the Quran in a regular manner, um, and, and then building on our own understanding of, of Islam as well. I think that would uh, help us build a divine connection that will consequently uh, allow us to be more cautious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be more protective of uh, our own actions. Okay. Regarding um, when we have family members that die, does the soul of the deceased get any benefit by family members when they collectively recite the Quran and send the blessings to the loved ones? Um, so th this is something that perhaps it's better to um, to ask someone who is a, a mufti or a scholar. I mean, there is a debate on this, and so I would, I would hold my comment on that. Okay, okay, that's fine. Um, so in the topic of um, evidence for the Akira, um, obviously from a Muslim point of view, we have our own uh, way in which we, we view this topic and the evidence for the Akira, we look at the Quran um, we recognize that in the society around us, um, where people are not looking at the Quran, people who are non-Muslims, 
Um, there is an increasing prevalence of uh, or fashion or trend not to believe in God and accept Darwinism uh, and atheism is becoming more and more prominent in, in, in society. Um, how should we engage on this topic of the evidence for Akira uh, with non-Muslims uh, who are atheists? Um, I, I think one of the things that is, that's important to keep in mind is that there are certain limits to any kind of rational conversation that we have with anyone that we may be speaking to. Uh, irrespective of the topic. So rash, rational conversation and rational arguments do not necessarily convince people. And, and a good example of that is that uh, I think Dr. Keith Moore is a person who looked into the, the, the science of embryology, as it's mentioned in the Quran, and, and he was a practicing Christian, a Canadian embryologist, and he used the description in Surat al-Mu'minun to update his textbook. And yet later, after he had updated his textbook, he was asked why he had not converted to Islam. And, and so very clearly, uh, he had seen the truth and um, you know, the Quran is, was much ahead of what he, the kind of research that was done during his time. And, and he was able to correct his own understanding of embryology uh, given that he was a scientist and an embryologist himself using the Quran. But in spite of that, he did not feel convinced to uh, enough to convert to Islam. And so when he was asked, he said, well, I come from a faith tradition and I'm deeply rooted in the Christian tradition. And yes, I believe in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being the messenger and this Quran being the divine revelation. Yet I insist on practicing Christianity. So in that case, I mean, that very clearly tells you that a rational exchange or intellectual exchange definitely has limits. And when we talk about faith, it is not necessarily the, the intellectual con conversation that we have that leads to conversion, but there is much more to the issue of conversion that allows people to go out, seek truth and find solace and comfort in, in the belief system, whatever that happens to be. Uh, that, uh, in, in, in their own belief system or in an acquired system of belief. So in terms of whether we should engage uh, with the, I mean, if, if this topic comes up, one of the ways, uh, at least based on what Sheikh Shabir Ali, Dr. Shabir Ali, who has a PhD in Islamic studies as well, that he identified, and, and he is of the opinion that we should use and leverage any kind of tools that are available in, in the modern philosophical discourse, like this whole theory about the, the, the correspondence theory of truth and the coherence theory of truth. And there are other Christian ministers and bishops as well that, that use these kind of uh, discourses to, to advance their argument. Uh, so that's one approach. Um, but I, I think unless we have more specifics, unless we know exactly what the background of the person is, it's difficult to give a more general kind of answer. What's important to realize is that there are certain limits to an intellectual conversation. Uh, what matters a lot more sometimes is the kind of trust that you have with that person. Uh, because if I have that degree of trust, that may allow my whatever I have to say to find root in the heart of the person and may lead to a conversion, if you will. Uh, and, and many times if we lack that trust, irrespective of however strong our, our arguments may appear to be on the surface, it would never really result in that conversion that we were so eagerly looking for. Okay, JazakAllah Karen. So inshallah, this will be the last question. For those of us um, who are perhaps fortunate to, let's say, experience earthquakes, you know, particularly living in, um, on the West Coast, or, or perhaps even um, ne next time we experience thunder and lightning, how should we remember, uh, I'm trying to think of practical tips to remember uh, what we've learned today. Um, how should we reflect those natural things that happen around us to the remembrance of Zanzibar as it was described in 
it'll be versus Asura Mahaj. And so, you know, when you, if you go to Muslim societies uh, in some of the Muslim countries where the tradition is there, uh, a lot of times you would see when this, these kind of calamities strike, uh, people would head towards the masjid. Uh, they would call out the adhan, for example. Uh, they would they would recite Quran. They would engage in, in some level of dhikr and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think that serves as the best guide for us as well, living in the West, that we may not have those same kind of privileges, but at the same time, when we experience uh, anything that essentially serves as a as a display or as a proof of the magnificence and the majestic nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we uh, make istighfar um, and, and, and seek forgiveness for any shortcomings that we may have and, and seek his protection of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, Jazakallah uh, With that, we will uh, conclude today's session. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. Awadu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wal asr. Inna l-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-lazina amanu wa amilu s-sanihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haq. Wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Sadaqallahu al-nazim. Assalamu alaikum.